the way I was thinking about uh, political landscapes in the context of these three talks is somewhat similar to that of technology. If technology is embedded and reflected in our built landscapes, so too are our politics. Um, in Ohio, we may tend to just consider ourselves blue and red and that type of thing, but uh, the, the depth of politics and its influence on our landscape goes much beyond that. So whether landscape as a territory or landscape as a uh, profession and theoretical discipline, it is always politicized. And I think that the uh, three presenters that we have uh, this morning will, will really demonstrate that. Our first uh, presenter will be Jeanette Kim, who is co-director of Columbia University's Urban Landscape Lab. Uh, Takako Tajima is the co-founder and principal of Bureau East, a design practice uh, based in Los Angeles, among other places, but operating uh, uh, globally. Uh, although, I don't know if you have quite the same uh, office distribution as, as Laura's. Uh, Laura Crushamano is our third panelist, and she is a designer uh, with Gensler from based in San Francisco. Um, with that, I will turn the podium over to Jeanette. Hi, everyone. Um, it's really great to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me. And um, it's nice to be back at OSU after um, so many years. Um, and yeah, it does seem that if the, I was very happy that one of the conclusions of the last panel was that uh, technology is political. And maybe we can also decide that pol politics are technological. And actually, that's partly the point of my talk tonight. Uh, I just said tonight, <laughs> this morning. <laughs> She's like, one continuous day. <laughs> um, but anyway, um, I just want to um, introduce you a little bit to my research lab, the Urban Landscape Lab. And um, we are a group that's kind of de that's dedicated to looking at the intersection between design and ecology um, through the lens of um, public interest and public debate. And so we run a, a wide range of projects using a lot of different types of uh, uh, research techniques, ranging from um, situated media projects, like our Safari 7 project that um, creates uh, tours of animal life along public transit lines, um, starting with New York's number seven line, and then this summer um, uh, the project moved on to Beijing's number four line. Um, we are also currently working on a master plan and a series of pilot site designs for uh, Clearwater, and a nonprofit based in Beacon, New York, um, of the Fall Kill Creek, which runs through, this, through central Poughkeepsie. Um, and then lastly, um, among other types of work, um, we've also been I've been also been focusing on um, kind of interpretations of energy landscapes and infrastructures. Um, so that included um, an article on Biosphere 2 and the Underdome project that I want to show you today. Um, the Underdome project is um, an architect's guide to contend contending energy agendas. So you can think of it as a kind of crossover between an architect's handbook and a voter's guide to energy. Um, and in this lens, I wanted to um, uh, talk about the way that Jason has framed the question at the conference, um, which is to ask, what's next for landscape? What's next for performance? And how do we understand metrics in relationship to this question? Um, so with regards to the question of efficiency, I, I find a, uh, um, a useful lens for the pro for Sorry, I think a useful way to think about the issue, issues of efficiency and energy is to point to this Buckminster Fuller project. Um, it's Buckminster Fuller and Shoji Sadao um, uh, proposal in, in 1960 to create a two mile wide dome over midtown Manhattan. And the project is, is completely over discussed and over, <laughs> over published, but it's very important in many ways um, for, our, for our purposes. Um, because it starts to um, reinvent the way that we define efficiency around energy, and it starts to define a very particular kind of political attitude towards efficiency. Um, so, you know, in general, if we look at the problem of energy and we look at the issues of dwindling resources and, and uh, increasing uh, temperature, uh, in, sorry, if we look at global warming, um, we then ask how we reframe energy paradigms. And through that lens, we, have, as a profession, have a tendency to um, focus on the metrics of dollars and watts 
Um, we look towards lead standards. We try to spec the right projects. And I think in many ways, some of the projects this morning um, in the first session started to raise the question of the metrics through which we um, evaluate energy performance and, produ and um, improvements. Um, however, in many regards, and I'm not criticizing the projects this morning for doing this, but in many regards, this tendency to focus on dollars and watts tends to kind of give the issues um, or, or give one's hand over to the invisible hand of the market or to try to kind of keep hands off of Mother Nature. Um, and instead, I want to ask in this talk today how we can try to reframe issues of efficiency in ways that can deliberately and um, self-consciously take on issues of politics. So in Fuller and uh, Sadao's proposal for the Dome over Manhattan, um, there are some interesting calculations that come into play. Um, they uh, calculate that they could uh, reduce the surface area of the city to 185th of its, um, of its area. Um, they calculate that even simply the reduction of um, snow cleanup costs alone could help to pay for the um, heating of this giant internal space. Um, and in this way, you could say, yes, this is a kind of bunch of numbers and, and uh, calculations, but you could also point to um, the kind of implicit desire to create a new collective interior in this project. So there's a desire to take uh, these kinds of calculations of costs and benefits and start to bring them to a different population. Um, I, today, I would argue, all buildings and all landscapes are domes of a sort. Uh, they are massive architectural surfaces that regulate the city's ecosystems. Um, this time, they're not enclosed, they're not singular. Um, but they, too, are also atmospheric assemblies for diverse collectives. So with regards to Jason's provocation, um, this, this kind of question, how can we value landscapes beyond dollars and cents, I want to argue that we can evaluate landscapes not with a metric of performance designed through efficiency, but with a metric that reflects collective interests. Quantitative evaluation is a useful and important tool. These metrics bring to the surface a set of questions of common concern and ask what do we prioritize and who gets what. In the case of energy, the metrics of dollars and watts is, uh, dominates the discussion, but what about affordability, popularity, income equality metrics, leisure hours, biodiversity, or life expectancy? Through this lens, the political nature of landscapes, that is uh, to say issues of collective interest and concern, become something that we can now reckon with. Bigger questions like the future of the city, uh, the definition of the American dream, um, and equity come to the surface. So I'll explain the project to you um, brief, uh, generally, and then I want to go into some of the topics and examples that we cover in the project. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the Underdome project is a kind of voter's guide. Um, it currently exists in an online uh, version, um, which you can find at theunderdome.net, uh, which we developed with support from the Van Allen Institute New York Prize Fellowship. Um, we also conducted a number of interviews and held a series of panel discussions. Um, and many of the issues that I'm going to bring up tonight have come up through those panel discussions. Um, we're also currently developing the project um, as a publication with support from the Graham Foundation um, in which we'll take the kind of interdisciplinary conversations that we've been focusing on until now and cross them with work that designers are doing. So I'm excited to see how a lot of the projects that we're discussing now could get developed through this future publication. Um, the, what we are seeing here is the homepage to the website, and the website basically maps out a broad range of positions on energy. Um, they involve positions from economists, environmentalists, political scientists, policymakers, planners, and designers. Um, and it's organized around four major topics, um, power, territory, lifestyle, and risk. And each topic is basically organized as a kind of um, a, a structuralist grid or an approval matrix, however, however you want to put it, where you have these different axes um, of ideologies that different dome uh, positions are located. And then what you're seeing here are a series of domes, and each dome um, is drawn out as a kind of imaginary city or imagined city that represents um, particular uh, political positions or attitudes towards energy arrayed through, the, through that grid. So, um, in many ways, the goal of the project is to use ideas of comparison and debate that this map allows 
um, to basically ask us to question how narratives are, are kind of deeply embedded within attitudes towards, ener towards energy um, and begin to define new narratives through design or new positions that could be drawn on this same grid. So I will begin with, um, um, so here, by, by the way, you can just see some examples of our website and the way that um, each position is then drawn out further. And you can see um, attitudes and examples for the position and against the position on the, on the web page. Um, and then this is a short description of the panel discussions that we've had that I'll refer to in my talk. Um, so what I'd like to do today is go through the four topics, power, life, uh, power territory, lifestyle, and risk and talk through a couple of examples that help us to imagine what these issues are behind these topics. Um, first, let's talk about power. Um, power asks how government, um, corporations, individuals, nonprofits have the potential to restructure energy performance. And as you can see on the grid, um, the vertical um, axis is arrayed on a kind of individual or top-down spectrum. So you can look at, say, grassroots or um, libertarian um, ideals on the top, or um, kind of top-down, um, Tobias, this is for you, <laughs> uh, the top-down planners on the bottom. And then on the left-right spectrum, you can see a kind of range from a socialized, or let's say, uh, an, an attempt to redistribute resources to a population on the one hand, to a free market distribution of goods and services on the other. Um, from this, we can look at the way that um, projects like the American Recovery and, um, and Investment Act, which seems so long ago now, um, is in a way attempted to recover the question of big, um, the question of big government, and in some ways sort of operated on a kind of somewhat justified nostalgia for projects like the WPA era dams, the Tennessee Valley, Valley Authority, the Federal, uh, the ha Federal Highway Administration, um, the Mortgage Act, which in a way uh, did kind of establish a notion of big governance um, in this country. The stimulus bill uh, builds rail lines, retrofits structures, and weatherizes low-income homes, all in the name of creating jobs and reducing energy loads. Um, and they use a calculus of their own. They estimate that $1 spent will return $1.65 in energy-related benefits. Um, but as you all know, um, this, the ARRA has proved to be very diffuse in its action, um, has been limited to the ideas of repair and recovery rather than an investment in new infrastructures. Um, it has been limited to shovel-ready projects and has had a tendency to focus mostly on ideas of investment rather than, uh, sorry, incentives rather than investment. So we could go from um, an earlier era of big government to a new era of incentivization and compromise. So today's government is less um, uh, an era of Robert Moses um, and more an era of the personal trainer that works with corporations in various ways. Um, in contrast to this, we can look at ideas of free market um, uh, re revisionism or uh, free market um, uh, improvements to energy uh, markets. Sorry, that, that was totally circular. <laughs> in, in contrast, we can look at market-based um, improvements to um, uh, energy production and consumption. Um, so in an era of deregulation, indeed, it is the markets that determine price, that um, build infrastructures, that um, source uh, power, uh, power resources, and on and on. Um, and so pricing becomes the kind of metric for this. And um, if you can, uh, the, the theory here being that if the hidden costs or the external costs of, of energy production are brought into the market, that market that can then reduce consumption and increase uh, 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 renewable energy resource um, usage. So Tom Friedman gives us insight into this, and he says, there's only one big thing, uh, sorry, there's only one thing bigger than Mother Nature, and that is Father Prophet, and we have not even begun to enlist him in this struggle. Um, in contrast, um, or in, in some ways in alliance, you can look at, um, uh, uh, somewhat libertarian projects like Energy Hog that um, attempt to put the responsibility for energy reform on the individual. And so you see projects like this from the Energy Hog website, which teaches children to change light bulbs and strangely enough, go up into attics and change the insulation <laughs> completely <laughs> unsupervised. <laughs> um, or So in this way, you see both a kind of rejection of government regulation or direct investment, but at the same time, you also see the government used as the very vehicle for behavioral modif modification. Um, and then we can point to um, um, uh, 
uh, modes of individual activism and involvement um, ranging from um, uh, neighborhood uh, uh, organization to um, global um, uh, NGOs, um, such as the Red Cross here in, in, uh, in, the, in the example of a post-Katrina shelter in San Antonio. Um, and um, actually, I'm just gonna go back to the grid. Um, so in many ways, um, to essentially close uh, with the topic of power, um, you start to see a, a range of responses that in many ways are unspoken when we talk about energy, energy reform ideas, but are deeply embedded in each of these approaches. But at the same time, as ideological as many of these strategies might be, we're also constantly faced with compromise, um, crossovers, new positions, and complete confusion of any ideological clarity. Um, so you start to see new hybrids, and I think the Matt Kalogis talk last night pointed to this in many ways, that you see the post-industrial, the post, the de-industrialized, the new landscapes accumulated after um, accident or um, waste removal. You see this a kind of accumulation of ideologies kind of adding up in certain landscapes. Um, so for me, the question then becomes not do we work for the government or for the market, but rather what kind of com complicated alliance do we form between them? Um, how, for example, do we understand price equity? How do we define equity? Sorry, I just said that was a little confusing. How do we define price signals and how do we define equity um, when we talk about those alliances? Um, so in a sense, the question is not do we build WPA or uh, dams, but um, how do we deal with megastructures that disguise themselves as town centers and village centers? And it's this kind of new hybrid that I think is, is really the landscape of power today. Um, so to move on from power, I want to talk about territory. And um, territory um, is, the, the topic of territory asks how um, energy performance can reframe the networks of contemporary um, metropolitan regions. So as we develop ideas of the sustainable metropolis, um, what kind of images are we um, evoking, um, utopian or otherwise? Um, what narratives of agrarianism, modernism, globalism, medievalism, or neoliberalism are being smuggled in? Um, so we can look, for example, at, um, and I think here there's a lot of overlap with um, Tobias's um, um, work in, uh, with the Long Island in Index, is the index, right? Um, um, you can look at the uh, Regional Plan Association's America 2050 project, which attempts to map out um, mega regions which cross um, political state boundaries to recognize that labor pools, trade markets, um, and business districts, which, which we used to define just locally, are in fact um, uh, multi-state corridors that sort of extend through new political terrain. Um, the RPA envisions the revitalized city as a dense concentration of attenuated business corridors and commuter radii uh, circumscribed by labor pools and advocates for high-speed high speed rail as a key to economic expansion. Um, so key to this idea is an idea of growth, um, of uh, large-scale infrastructures that now require new forms of political representation to create. Um, if New York State is not interested in joining a Northeast Corridor um, high-speed rail line, um, this points to a, the need for new political representation structures. Um, in complete contrast to this idea of entanglement and cross-territorial um, connections and spread, um, you can look at Emery Lovins, um, the kind of father of um, natural uh, capitalism, and the theory of natural capitalism, um, as a kind of attempt to retreat from this kind of entanglement, to retreat from these expanding territories. Um, so Emery Lovins, um, who's the director of the Rocky Mountain Institute, is often considered to be the kind of father of efficiency, of energy efficiency. Um, he consults Fortune 500 companies and um, um, coaches them in adapting soft, what he calls soft path, soft energy paths, off the grid, localized, renewable energy resources, and supply chain adjustments that allow companies to have a lighter footprint. Um, his language, and I think he's really key to the idea of metrics that we talk about in energy efficiency. Um, Amory Lovins' met, met, metrics are always about dollars and watts. But it's interesting if you go back and read some of his earlier writings, he's much more overtly ideological in his stances. Um, and there's a very famous um, 1976 foreign affairs article um, that he wrote, that's just basically a kind of manifesto for a kind of reactionary agrarianism. 
Um, and he writes, he describes this kind of soft energy path, um, quote, in contrast to the soft path's dependence on pluralistic consumer choices in deploying a myriad of small devices and refinements, the hard path depends on, depends on difficult, large-scale projects requiring a major social commitment under centralized management. Individuals are, um, in, the, in the soft path case, individuals are thus freed from alien, remote, and perhaps humiliatingly uncontrollable technology run by a far away um, bureaucratized technical elite who have probably never heard of you. Um, so he just, for him, um, potential is found um, in the suburban landscape, um, and he writes, their diversity reflects their own pluralism. So for him, the, the escape from the kind of, this kind of large scale infrastructure that cities rely on um, points to a kind of return to the suburb, or a, a push towards the suburb. Um, so if the two, um, oh, I, I completely forgot that I put the slide in here, <laughs> um, but um, it, I think we could point to the density advocates that the RPA, the Regional Plan Association, is entirely part of this desire to kind of um, reclaim the city um, as a new um, efficient um, model of living and a new way to kind of um, intensify and connect infrastructures. I think that would be in, in stark contrast to Amory Lovins. Um, but all of these examples that I've talked about so far have been about growth, and um, in many ways it's important to recognize how the so-called sustainable city deals with lack of growth, um, with the shrinking city. Um, and so if we are, and again, I think this touches on a lot of comics that came up already, that if we look at the post-industrial shrinking, shrinking city, um, we look at the foreclosure ghettos kind of um, left from the past couple of years of the foreclosure crisis, um, you can you find attempts to redensify, attempts to claim um, uh, a space for new uh, populations, um, uh, new ways to bring immigrant life into um, uh, suburban um, new town cores, and new ways to approach um, um, aging in place strategies. You also start to see um, attempts to kind of rework the, the city through, ver through its very um, act of shrinking. Um, and in this sense, um, to conclude with the territories topic, um, I want to make the point that sustainability, the, si the sustainable city isn't so much about self-sustenance, um, but a question of how we manage energy networks that cross and connect political domains. Um, and in a sense, these new kind of energy Kurdistans um, are, um, uh, pose a new set of questions in the way that we um, uh, uh, advocate for different energy um, approaches, um, and start to link um, dependencies and independencies between networks. Um, so I'm gonna have to speed up a bit, but um, we could talk briefly about lifestyle. Um, and lifestyle asks how energy performance schemes imagine public norms and behavior. Um, and so we can look at um, attitudes towards commercial consumerism or anti-consumerism on the one end, or a spectrum from the traditional household to the non-traditional household on the other. Um, projects like the um, GE data visualization, uh, which goes hand in hand with the green energy, the, with energy star ratings, are a way to bring in, again, the metrics of energy use and now place um, the kind of burden for its interpretation on the individual consumer. Um, so it's the, it's the homeowner who buys the dishwasher that becomes the kind of watchdog of, um, of the industry. Um, <coughs> similarly, we can see attempts um, through um, um, Programs, for example, um, connected to the Federal Mortgage Act, or that build on the Federal Mor Mortgage Act, that um, give incentives to homeowners to install solar panels. Um, we can see uh, so solar panels in their houses. We can see a kind of attempt to um, reclaim or re kind of support again this idea of home ownership as a critical um, step to the American dream um, um, in the name of energy efficiency. Um, similarly, um, there's a group called um, the uh, Citizens Housing and Planning Council that advocates to change um, zoning codes in New York City that currently um, bar more than three unrelated adults to live together and look at um, new ways of creating density in housing or hybrid conditions in housing um, that, are, um, that really go far beyond the, the definitions of normal or traditional living um, in the name, um, par in partly in the name of energy efficiency. Um, so, again, through lifestyle, um, we start to see this kind of question of the crossover or the link between consumerism and activism 
And in many ways, the line is, is very blurred and has become quite confused um, as we've started to understand lifestyle only through the lens of consumerism. Um, but through lifestyle, we also see um, um, a kind of fascinating way in which um, political activism and the kind of aesthetics of living start to intersect. So even just questions of locavorism, restraint, conspicuous consumption, leisure pastimes, which designers all play a very heavy role in, become kind of active in, the, in this question. Okay, that was the fastest category. <laughs> um, and then I want to end with risk. And, um, and this is, I think, where I get back to some of the issues of metrics again. So risk is tricky, but risk asks how we can distribute the benefits and hazards of uncertain futures. So in other words, when we invest in new infrastructures, um, when we size mechanical systems or engineer new atmospheres, we respond to unknown hazards and construct new ones at the same time. So we don't know how quickly the earth is going to, to uh, uh, heat up. We don't know exactly what the price of oil will be, but we still have to deal with these uncertainties. So who makes these decisions, um, and, and, and who do these decisions affect? Uh, the problems of a warming planet are felt far away from their original source, um, from drought in the Sahara to a coal power plant in the US, as a kind of displaced collateral damage. Um, so populations grappling with warming trends have new shared interests and can pool their risks as ways of mitigating them. So um, we can look, for example, at the way that the 1968 National Flood Insurance Program basically um, created a government subsidy to homeowners along shore er shoreline areas, um, which really dramatically changes the way that um, um, housing areas respond to ever-increasing flooding risks, and basically redistributes that risk to the American taxpayer through this insurance program. Um, or we can look at attempts by many planners to basically dis detangle um, highly entangled um, infrastructures, and I think the, the blackout of 2003 is a good example of the dangers of, of catastrophic failure that can kind of cascade itself through these interconnected systems. Or similarly, you can look at the way that um, groups like the Intercontinental Hotels Group um, basically needs to, to, uh, to finance this, its own structures in response to ever-increasing hurricane rates. Um, and then lastly, and perhaps most frighteningly, um, we could look at the uh, uh, speculative proposal to place, uh, inject a sulfur dioxide cloud into our atmosphere, thereby cooling the Earth's atmosphere. And I think this becomes a kind of um, all too potent but, but fascinating example of the way that global warming trends do tie together collective interests. Okay, so I'm over time, but I have to go through these more slides. <laughs> um, I wanted to, in conclusion, talk about four different metrics um, and talk about how they're used differently and how they employ a different politics. And this is important to risk because when you, th when you think about risk, you're always calculating an imagined future. You never really know what your risks are, so you're completely dependent on metrics to tell you what they are. So if we were to look at Fuller from the start to understand this kind of redistribution of heating costs to a new internal Manhattan population. Um, we could also look at the way that the EPA values the um, statistical value of life. Um, I don't know if you guys know about this, but each department is obligated, each department in the US government is obligated to have a statistical value of life through which they can measure, say, the, the cost benefit of um, investing in arsenic removal or um, uh, capping carbon emissions on cars. So the EPA's uh, value of statistical life right now is $9.1 million per life, which has increased $3 million since with the Bush administration. Um, the FDA, in contrast, values it at $7.9 million, and the Department of Transportation at $6 million. So um, and then we can also look at another metric from Bjorn Lomborg, the kind of famous environmental skeptic, who argues that investing in um, which you see here. These are the value of investment. So these are, um, so sorry, he's basically arguing that it's very cheap to deal with uh, um, diseases like AIDS and HIV um, or malaria, and it's very expensive to deal with climate change. And so his argument is that although climate change is real and needs to be dealt with, we should deal with the, the viable ones first. And then lastly, I just wanted to uh, talk about this group um, uh, based at NYU who is basically trying to do the exact opposite from what Lomborg is doing, and they're basically tying um, the costs of investment in new energy technologies to things like um, um, health benefits, um, uh, diseases that uh, form due to pollution, um, 
mortality rates due to um, extraction um, practices and so on. Um, so with this, um, I will close. Um, and um, I just wanted to point out that as the, the intention of our project is really to kind of frame the, the kind of conflicts and affiliations through uh, among various energy agendas. And our hope is that we, um, we designers will use this to um, increasingly take a stand on issues um, while recognizing the contradictions and imposing perspectives um, behind each approach. And in some cases, um, the differences are irreconcilable and we simply just need to frame the choices that must be made through informed public debate. But in other cases, new alliances and new hybrids um, between previously entrenched positions can also be found and activated. And in this way, the role of a designer is not just to take sides, but to frame the very terms of debate. So thank you very much. I do. Um, first of all, thank you, Jason, for inviting me. And um, but um, I guess I'm going to have to be honest with you. Um, in the past, I've talked about my um, projects um, from the viewpoint of um, ecology, culture, infrastructure, historic preservation, which I guess you know all relate to politics in some way. Um, but never have I really thought about my work specifically um, from the political lens. So whether or not you know, what I talk about today is along the lines of what you've been t thinking of um, is up for grabs, but um, I'm going to attempt to talk about um, uh, practicing landscape architecture within um, a, a certain political continuum and how that has affected my attitude about contemporary practice and um, uh, through projects, um, try to explain, um, uh, I guess, try to show landscapes that ex express uh, the politics of a, of a particular place. Um, I'm not sure how many of you remember um, from last year um, uh, an article, an editorial that Bruce Nussbaum, who was the managing editor of uh, Business Week's um, coverage on design and innovation um, wrote. Uh, he created a, a, a sort of a firestorm by asking uh, the question, is uh, humanitarian design the new imperialism? Uh, within a month of the editorial's uh, publication, uh, there were responses from all over the, the design uh, blogosphere. Um, people, uh, there were you know, sincere attempts to answer the questions. Uh, th but there were also plenty of people who were up in arms and defensive about their own work in developing countries. Um, what I can say, I guess, is that in his article, Nussbaum is uh, spot on in one respect, and that is the fact that uh, there's a huge interest in uh, designing in so-called developing countries uh, today. Uh, just to name a few, um, and, and sort of the obvious, there's the work of Architecture for Humanity, uh, there's Urban Think Tank, um, and then even, uh, you know, my good friends, uh, Shalina, Jennifer, and Arthur of, of KDI, who are doing um, some interesting work in Kibera, uh, Nairobi. Um, there's also been a flurry of awards that have emerged, um, actually awards and forums that have emerged, specifically uh, recognizing this kind of work, such as the Index Award um, out of Copenhagen, um, whose subtitle is, um, you know, Ways to Improve Life. Uh, there's the EME 3 awards in Barcelona. There's the Wholesome Award for Sustainable Construction that is currently now um, sort of, a, you know, uh, announcing uh, 
the, the different regional prizes. Um, there's a UN Habitats World Urban Forum. There's MoMA Small Change, big, or Small Scale Big Change, and there's Urban Forum. Um, you know, the list goes on and on. Uh, what isn't clear, however, um, is the answer to Nussbaum's uh, main question, which is, again, is humanitarian design uh, the new imperialism? Um, about four years ago, I got involved in uh, a project in the Kingdom of Morocco. Morocco, as you know, is it's a country in uh, northern Africa. Um, along with Spain, it frames the western entry into the Mediterranean Sea at the Strait of Gibraltar. Um, but between 1912 and 1956, uh, it was a French protectorate. Um, and although over half a century has passed since Morocco gained independence, the influence that the French has had continues to resonate throughout. Um, Matt Coolidge explained yesterday how man has affected every surface on this planet and that today everything and everywhere is essentially man-made. Uh, while in a similar vein, I think it suffice to say that Moroccan terrain today is a manifestation of its colonial past. Regardless of whether something was shaped as a result of or in reaction to um, its colonial past, pretty much all of Morocco, um, especially um, its urban areas, have been in some way affected by its 44 years under uh, French rule. Beyond the general fact that Morocco um, uh, was once a French protector, there's a profound reason uh, for this dual perception relative to foreign designers. Um, all the while that Morocco was a, a French protectorate, uh, the cities were governed by an apartheid system uh, that segregated the French population from the local Moroccan population. Alongside the existing medinas, the, the French planned um, and designed uh, and built new cities uh, for themselves um, for, the, uh, for themselves um, that segregated the French population uh, from the native, um, or, or sorry, uh, cities from the south to which the local population was banned entry. Um, this is a picture of uh, Cahiers um, Central, uh, which was um, designed, uh, planned and designed by Atbat Afrique, um, uh, of which uh, uh, one uh, George Candelis um, was a part of, and as you know, he, he was one of the founding members of um, Team 10. Um, and so it actually, um, you know, this particular project, um, for those of you who don't know, who already know it, um, can, is, is, is often argued um, as sort of the, um, I guess, one of the projects that, that sort of contributed um, to the demise of Siam. Um, it's some, you know, it's th through this project, um, which came about because of the apartheid regime, um, people began talking about sort of, you know, what it was to design sort of in, um, in a foreign country. Um, so uh, this history inevitably uh, creates, a t creates tension for foreigners who come to work uh, in the planning and design industry in Morocco. Um, you become keenly aware um, of the fact that uh, there's a potential for you to be perceived, you know, either as an expert or uh, as a neo-colonialist. Um, so then how, you know, how does one sort of operate within these conditions? How do you ab avoid uh, being sort of labeled a neo-colonialist or, or that you're being paternalistic? Um, it's, it's, you know, it's a question basic I'm still trying to answer, but um, although I will not go to the extent of um, that Rem Koolhaas House has gone to proclaim that emerging megacities such as Lagos, Nigeria, represents the future for all of our cities. Um, I believe that the transfer of uh, design strategies and methodologies uh, can move in both directions and in many forms. Um, what I've learned through my work in Morocco is that culture serves um, uh, a useful and necessary entry point uh, for design interventions. Uh, through a thorough understanding of the culture place, we can make meaningful decisions that maximize the transformative power that a project can offer. And based on projects, uh, so based on projects set in Morocco where the opportunistic use of uh, landscape infrastructure is a necessity born out of the lack of financial resources and the urgency to uh, address basic needs, 
I'd like to today uh, present scenarios that highlight this approach. Uh, working through the uh, knowledge and idea of context, uh, mainly through those of its residents. Our team helped to envision a number of cultural outcomes uh, related to the revitalization of a uh, forgotten river in the, in the Medina of Fez um, and for tourism in um, the Moroccan Sahara. These outcomes uh, served as blueprints for the creation of new living systems that pushed us to conflate all of our backgrounds uh, in landscape, planning, engineering, and architecture so that solutions to social economic concerns would work to also re resolve infrastructure problems um, and vice versa. So s starting with the uh, Fez River project, I'm gonna uh, sort of give background on this. Um, the Medina of Fez um, manifests one of the most consistent and comp comprehensive urban morphologies of its type. In 1981, it was the first of its kind to be named a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Before the 20th century, it was the most studied city in North Africa and perceived to epitomize one of the distinctive forms of urban civilization. Perhaps so to Morocco's peripheral geographic location, which allowed it to escape the onslaught of invasions and destructive power struggles that befell other prominent Medinas, and to its 44 years as a French protectorate, um, the homogeneity of its fabric and legibility of its spatial organization are still present today. 12 centuries after it emerged, its resilience and capacity to absorb change has allowed it to remain a living city and the, evade the kind of museumification that transpires most places upon which historic significance is bestowed. The Medina of Fez emerged in 789 AD as two separate nuclei on either sides of a free-flowing river. It grew quickly as an urban center and due to, it, uh, due to the prominence of the Karawiyan Mosque, uh, which also housed one of the leading universities in the Middle East, Fez became an important node for Moorish art and culture. By the beginning of this 12th century, the two towns had fused into one, and the river emerged as an integral element to its urbanism. A network of over 200 fountains throughout the city, most of them uh, ablution fountains um, of mosques, gave Fez the appellation, the city of a thousand fountains, and was associated with pockets of relief, both spiritually and spatially from the dense fabric of the Medina. However, over the course of centuries, the city's dependence on the river to support an ever-growing population and a flourishing leather industry uh, severely impacted water quality and, and fountains were either shut off or linked to another water source. When Morocco gained independence from France in 1956, Upper income families were fleeing the Medina for the Ville Nouvelle, leaving behind a swelling working class population and um, single family courtyard homes were subdi subdivided to create multifamily housing and open spaces that served as orchards between the city and the ramparts were rapidly filled with more housing. With the industrialization of leather and copper crafts, toxic chemicals were introduced to the waste stream and by the late 1950s, the river was considered a sewage channel rather than a river, um, and aptly was named the Wed Bukhrade, which means the river of trash. While Morocco was still a protectorate, half of the river through the Medina was paved over with little opposition, ironically allowing on top uh, the introduction of vehicular access in city with one of the most cohesive pedestrian networks in the world. The erasure of the river was furthered in 2004 by ad hoc, ad hoc construction, marring historic bridges and buildings along the way. And in 2007, the planning agency decided that it would be a great idea to encourage even more traffic into the Medina and channelize one of the uh, last soft bottom portions of the river so that they could build a new road into a new parking lot. And let me remind you that th this is all within uh, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Several years ago, we began working with the department responsible for water and power in the city of Fez, uh, the RADEF, to develop a strategic remediation plan for the Fez River to be implemented upon completion in two broader urban, and, uh, two sewage treatment facilities. Through a detailed analysis of the Medina and its broader urban ecological context, we choreographed a phased implementation strategy in which measures for enhancing water quality became both the locus and the agent for a new collective memory. 
fundamentally, uh, the outcome is three new uh, public spaces in the Medina. And then comprehensively, the project also um, addresses a, a number of culture, a, a number of issues, uh, improves regional water quality, provides uh, shade, introduces greenery, remediates contaminated soils, creates safe play areas for children, restores historic buildings, leverages the existing skills of local builders and craftsmen, improves both social and economic conditions for workers in the ailing leather industry, and establishes Fez as a destination for leather craft and design. The project works at uh, two scales, the city scale and the, the scale of the Medina. Um, so the city scale, um, which includes both the Villeneuve Val, which is the, the new city that the French had built, and the Medina, the project is a master plan with recommended measures for improved regional water quality. And to highlight an often forgotten idea that the Wed Bukhareb um, is not just a sewage canal, but in fact an integral part of a greater river network. Depending on soil geomorphology, levels of water pollution, adjacent urban fabric, and ecological systems, different rehabilitation tactics are purposely, purposefully located. Um, I'm sure this audience is aware of um, you know, the, the different uh, water remediation um, and tactics and the different uh, rehabilitation tactics. So I'm going to go through this very quickly. Basically, um, you know, we, we came up with uh, eight um, sort of tactics. Um, the restore technology, which, um, uh, which, which cleans water in like the, the, the existing uh, channelized rivers. Um, bank stabilization to reduce erosion that can cause turbidity in uh, water bodies. Green streets to reduce the amount of polluted stormwater runoff from entering waterways um, and to ease the strain on municipal sewage and drainage systems. Uh, upland erosion control, which um, similarly uh, reduces turbidity. Um, constructed wetlands that duplicate ecosystem services that natural wetlands provide and can also serve as wildlife habitats. Urban stormwater management in the form of infiltration basins and bioswales. Um, oh, in the form of infiltration basins and bioswales that use plants to extract pollutants. Um, rainwater harvesting that can supplement water from the tap and is cheaper and more sustainable in the long run than a centralized water source. Um, and in fact, we recommended to the RADEF that they incentivize rainwater um, harvesting in certain overlay areas um, where we saw uh, you know, residential, predominantly residential um, land use. Uh, soil phyto remediation, which extracts um, heavy metals from contaminated soils that leach toxins into uh, gray water. Um, although it may require more time and space, it's cheaper and doesn't require much energy. And it can also be used um, to educate the public about best management practices. At the scale of the Medina, the project takes advantage of the few remaining vacant and, and soon to be vacant sites within the Medina to introduce uh, three critical in interventions uh, strategically phased to enhance water quality, remediate contaminated sites, and create open space. And site one is the Recif Plaza, which sits above a portion of the river that was paved over when Morocco was still a French protectorate and until very recently served as uh, the Medina's main intermodal hub. During the day, it was always full of people, cars, motorbikes, donkeys, buses, um, and the site was one large uh, paved surface. Uh, we envisioned the Recif becoming uh, a, a critical, okay, a critical threshold for a new pedestrian uh, river promenade with programs such as the amphitheater, outdoor cafes, native garden that would double as a stormwater infiltration zone, four courts, um, pick up and drop off areas for donkeys, et cetera. Uh, site two, um, the Andalus site, uh, was a parking lot. Um, it's where, it is actually, it's currently a parking lot. Um, it, and it's also where uh, the, the tannery, um, in this, the leather tannery um, industry used to dry their hides. Um, so with this comes uh, a lot of um, contamination from chromium. And so what we suggested was that, you know, that uh, 
that the soils there can be um, removed um, for uh, XC to remediation, and then that we would, uh, you know, we propose that a new playground be created, um, and then also that the area could um, uh, accommodate um, a new constructed wetland for uh, for uh, helping to clean the water further. The Sharara Tanneries is one of the biggest tourist attractions in Fez. Um, it's also the most toxic um, land uses within the Medina. Uh, to improve both the quality of life for Medina residents and to re reduce, reverse the environmental degradation associated with the tanning process within the Medina, um, the city is actively engaged in a process to relocate the tanneries outside of the Medina uh, in, in a new uh, craft corridor called Ainokbi. Um, we based our proposal on um, some research that was already uh, that had already been done um, by a, an NGO um, headed by um, actually uh, some of our professors, Francois Vigier and Mona Sarageldine, um, that actually they, they said uh, they were suggesting that the tanneries be, be moved out because of all the um, uh, the polluting effects. Um, Anyways, overall, what we had hoped to create was a project that would have the potential to uh, stitch or blend this juncture between the needs of a 20th, 21st century population and the preservation of a unique uh, medieval urban form. Um, I guess I'm like really out of time. No? Huh? Okay. Um, so the, the second project, the Terragal Ecolage, um, I'm going to go through this, I guess, really quickly. But uh, this, is, this is a project that's um, located in southern Morocco, which is actually um, already in itself is a highly politicized site. Um, it's at the end of a, a lush valley called the Draw, and it's adjacent to hostile uh, dunes, uh, desert dunes. Uh, it used to be part of an old caravan trade route um, between sub-Saharan Africa and the Mediterranean shore. Uh, but the caravans are long gone because um, because of the, uh, the the sort of the issues um, involving uh, s southern Morocco, where they had to uh, sort of strengthen the borders uh, relative to the, um, there's all this stuff happening because of um, post-colonial sort of tension, political tensions. Um, but basically, um, let me see. Sorry, I forgot to <laughs> go through the slides. Um, basically, uh, I guess the, the idea that we had for the Terragal Ecolage was um, instead of thinking about um, ag uh, tourism as something that takes away from the existing conditions within um, uh, this environment, uh, we, we tried to imagine a way uh, by which tourism would act actually act um, together collaboratively in stewardship of the landscape. So. Um, uh, what we said was, um, you know, the, that the Ecolodge would aim to introduce an alternative um, to the existing model of tourism um, and affect a number of cultural outcomes that includes protecting the desert ecosystem, cushioning against droughts, uh, warding um, ad advancing dunes, um, maximizing um, the efficacy of um, scarce resources, uh, nurturing local and regional pride in the area, bolstering traditional cultural practices, sustaining local know-how, uh, promoting unity between local villages, uh, developing local economic opportunities that are specifically aligned to their culture, establishing um, a convenient way for locals to learn how to read, introduce, um, and introduce unique tourist experiences. Um, so I guess like at the end of, you know, sort of at, at the end of these two projects, um, it's, you know, you're probably wondering, it's like, what now? Um, where are we with these sort of proposals? Um, 
the, what's interesting is that uh, the two projects have diverged um, sort of in outcome or in, in progress uh, completely. Um, we could never have imagined how quickly the, the Fez River project would sort of be implemented. Um, on the other hand, um, it's been embraced by the municipality, but then at the same time, um, you know, we've been sort of edged out or marginalized um, and, and we're functioning mostly just as advisors. Uh, on the other hand, the Terrigal Eco Lodge, which is moving at a much slower um, pace, we um, are still you know, actively a part of it. And the reason it's slow is mainly because we're still working on developing funding for the project. So um, ultimately, I mean, I, I guess it's hard to say you know, what, what is, you know, what is how, do you, how do we present ourselves in a country that's uh, suspicious of foreigners, um, but uh, I guess it, it's it's mainly um, prob I guess it, it's it relates more to the context rather than um, to how we behave. So you know we in both projects we actively engage the community, um, the the local population, but it's really I think uh, it depends on I guess like uh, how. For instance, in the Fez River project, how embedded um, certain actors already are um, within the system. So thank you.